Genesis 3. Looking at verse 6. Well, let's just look at verse 4. Uh, the serpent said to the woman, Surely you shall not die. In a discussion about what God had taught him at Bible study, about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so now he comes out and he write, just straight out challenges God's authority on if you eat, dying, you will die. You surely will not die, he says. He, he, used, the same, he used the same Hebrew to, sell the, to tell them they would not absolutely die. See, listen, the devil always attacks the absolute truth. He doesn't mind if you're screwy about it. If, if you say, well, I know what the Bible says, and then you really don't. You just quote it, and you really don't know what it says. What, the, what God is after in your life is absolute truth. The example of it. When Pilate was examining Jesus, Judicially, he asked Jesus how he would define truth. In uh, in that judicial hearing of Jesus before he went to the cross. My point is this, and and he wasn't open to accept the answer anyhow. But what the Greek culture was looking for, what the Greek culture was looking for in the Greek culture through a guy called Aristotle was what is absolute truth? Kant picked that up later as a philosopher and explored it as well. Pilate also was exploring that idea as a Roman influenced in Greek culture. Well, you say that you're the truth. What does that mean? How do you know that what you believe is true and what other people believe is not true? And the answer is, what does the Bible say? Because the world does not believe in absolute truth. Now, if you broke it down and explained it to them how this whole system works in the world. For example, you have a week. Where did the week come from? How do you know there's only seven days in a week? And how do you know the whole number system works? Where did the number system come from? Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and then you have 40 days then you have 969 years. Where did that all come from? And why do we trust that? You see? It's because the Bible says it. The one absolute truth that we have is what the Bible says, and therefore Satan knows that, and so he wars you over what does the Bible say. And People will say to me, well, Ron, you say this is what it means, and other men say this is what it means. How do you know what it means? Well, you go to the absolute truth. You look, this is one of the reasons that drove me to the languages. That's what, what drove me to the Hebrew and the Greek. So that I could have the final answer on that. And that was a wonderful thing that uh, in my life, because I wondered that. I mean, what makes... What makes the Christian faith greater than anybody else's? So here we are, and the devil fights the absolute truth. He fights it. He don't mind if you believe truth and you don't know what that means. See, he, had, he got Eve on that. He doesn't mind the fact that you're into truth. He don't want you into absolute truth. He don't want you to have that kind of confidence. So the serpent said to the woman, you, shall, you surely or you absolutely will not die. For God knows, now watch, it, watch what he sold her. 
What God, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, when they commit this sin against God, their eyes are going to be opened. And they're not going to be like God because they were already like him before they sinned. What they're going to be like is like him. They're going to be like the devil who sinned. That's what they're going to be like. They're going to know it. And it's going to make their life miserable when they find that out, that they've been had. When the woman saw, this is her wild imagination. This is imagination gone wild. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was delight to the eyes, and it was desire to make one wise. She took from the fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband that was with her, and he ate. We recently did a, a lengthy study on a, on a title of how to beat Satan at his own game. We called it Just Three Plays. It comes from 1 John 2, 16. He has just three plays that he hooks you with. And they're all three in the verse 6. All three of them in the verse 6. For example, in 1 John 2, 16, it says that one of his plays is called the lust of the flesh. The second is lust of the eyes. And the third is the boastful pride of life. All three of them are used against Eve. Watch this. The woman saw that the tree was good for food. The tree was never to be good for food, was it? In fact, just the opposite. It was just, it, just the opposite. It was the tree of death if you ate from it. And so there's the lust of the flesh. Uh, she saw that it was delightful to the eye. That's called the lust of the eye. And she took from the fruit and ate and gave to her husband and he ate. That's the boastful pride of life. Did they get life? He, he said, oh, your life is going to be better than it's ever been. But it wasn't, was it? It was worse than it had ever been. They were now into death. They were not into life. And the boastful pride of life got him into death. Do you understand that? Boastful pride of life, if you'd have worked it properly, the boastful pride of life says, God says don't eat. I'm already in life. God says don't eat or I'm going to die. I don't know, but I know that's the opposite of life. I'm going to stay with life. But she didn't, did she? She ate, and her husband was standing beside her Right? And should have had a witness for Christ right there. Stand at the tree. She, he should have, when she reached up for that fruit, he should have said, hmm, he should have intervened. But he didn't. Or, you know, Romeo and Juliet. Well, if you're going to die, I'm going to die with you. Now, here's what I want to teach you today. The Bible says about marriage, we're still in marriage. The Bible says that two become one. That's unique biblical math, ain't it? One and one is one in marriage. One and one is one. The two shall become one. We talked the last time about compromise. Everybody's in this word compromise. It's Latin. Do you know what the word in there is? You know what the noun is? In compromise? The cop on the front means two coming to an agreement into one promise. The Bible says it's two becoming one in the mind of Christ. Compromise is not the answer. Compromise is not, that's the worldly view. It's not the biblical view. Because where's the promise? 
one of you have to surrender. One of you have to surrender. And therefore, one person doesn't really get a, a, a equity. Everybody's talking about equity today. When you go to the mind of Christ, you surrender your view, he surrenders his view, and you go to see what the view of the Bible says. What does the mind of Christ say? That's absolute truth. you got relativity on either side. Compromise is a word the world used. It means to come together, come together into one promise. I promise I will do my part, and you'll promise to do your part. Nobody does either part. And then so you're fighting again. Because you don't have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 16. So, it brings me to a very simple solution to your marital problems. You can go to counseling to the nth degree. But your solutions to your marital problems should be simple. You should ask yourself, what does the Bible say? And when you find what the Bible says about your conflict, you should both come to a common agreement with God about it. You do that when you confess your sin, don't you? God says, that's sin. You say, well, I don't know. He said, he put you on the word on it. He said, well, there it is. And then he says, now I want you to confess that. I want you to confess that to me. And I want you to get into one mindness with me, right? We shouldn't be going over this every week, every day, every time you get in a little uproar. Here we are. We're right back where we started. We shouldn't be doing this all the time. One mind means stick to that one mind in Christ. What does the Bible say? You shouldn't have to keep going, going, going to the same problem. You should be getting solutions from it. And, and that's what we're trying to get you to understand. Now, watch what happens in the story of Adam and Eve. They both did come to one agreement. Do you agree with that? Did they both come to one agreement? Yeah. Did they both eat from the forbidden tree? So they did come, they did come didn't they? They conspired together against the will of God. Do you see that? Did they conspire against the will of God? Did they both understand it? Yes, they did. The devil says, oh, your life will be so much better if you eat from that tree. You do know the devil's a liar, and it is his nature to lie, and then he uses deception to cover it. You know that? So today, we're going to take a look at this idea of two believers conspiring, coming into one mind against God. You'll be surprised how, how often that stuff comes up in your marriage. So we'll talk about that. This lesson is conspiring against the will of God, Two minds becoming one in conspiring against the will of God. It will show how two can become one in, in conspiring against the will of God. Listen to me, to the peril of their life. If you think you're going to come out cleaner than you went in, you're not. You're not going to come off. He said, oh, you'll be so much better off if you will go against God. And, and the answer was, no, no, but they weren't. <laughs> they were worse off, weren't they? They were a lot worse off. So, what God had in mind in this couple was to come to one mind in Christ. But the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was delightful to the eye, that is a desire to make one wise, right, in that lie. So she took from the fruit and ate and gave to her husband, he ate. We have disobedience and defiance. God had in mind, what God had in mind was these two in marriage to become one mind in Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16. That's what he desired. 
the two people in marriage as believers in Christ should become one mind in Christ. So I'm in point one. Adam and Eve became one in conspiring as a couple against the will of God. This wasn't what God had in mind when he said two should become one. What God had in mind was that we would become one mind in Christ, and that is by putting your head in the Word of God. If you think that you're going to solve your problems, whether, wherever they are in your life, by ignoring the Word of God, you have bought into Satan's system. You've bought into his system. And you're lying to yourself. You're lying to your marriage. And nothing good will come from it. Nothing good will come from this. You need to read the story of Adam and Eve. Nothing good is going to come from that. Nothing good. In 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verses 4 through 7, should be a good read for you. I pulled out verse, verse 5 when he said, here is how you fight in the angelic conflict. We are destroying speculations. That's what Eve had. We are destroying speculation and every lofted thing raised up against the knowledge of God. Now who's running the system called speculation and lofty things that opposes the word of God? Yeah? There's only another system in the world that runs, it, runs the world. It runs the world in that system. And you'll get caught up in speculation and lofty ideas that will destroy your life because the devil's lying to you because you're not putting your head in the Word of God and fighting for it. You need to know what the Bible says and then do it. See, Adam and Eve know what the Bible said, didn't they? They knew what the Bible said. Did they do it? They conspired against God and thought they were going to come out of this. You know, the one guy that could have pulled them out of the fire was standing there supporting her bad decisions, wasn't she? Huh? The husband was standing by supporting her bad decisions. He knew there were bad decisions and he was supporting it. That's like... Your wife's caught on fire and you're throwing gasoline on her. Thinking that's going to solve her problem. <laughs> he should have intervened. He should have intervened. And he didn't. And he's going to pay a heavy penalty for it. Death is going to sweep over his life, his, wife or his wife's life, over his children's life. This consequence that's going to be carried is going to fall, fall, fall out into his work area, his marriage, his family, everything. Before this thing clears out, it's going to be a mess. You have no idea what you're playing with when you mess with God. You have no idea what you're messing with when you go to devil to solve your issues in your life rather than the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. You walk by faith and you walk by the power of the right. What does faith do for me, Ron? 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, if I walk by faith, right? I am to walk by faith, not by what? Sight. Was Eve walking by sight? Who tricked her to do that idea? Who tricked her in life that she would be a lot better off going by sight than by faith? You walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in the power of the flesh. Why are you going to flesh to solve your problems? You haven't got one problem in your life the flesh, will, the flesh can solve, it creates more. How many times do you have to learn that a week 
to understand that's failure. You shouldn't have to go through that exercise one time and you, when you go, like, whoa, that exercise wasn't any good. You know, an interesting thing that happened in my life when I got saved, I was a young adult when I got saved. I couldn't believe how much money I had after I got saved. I had money. At the end of the week, I still had money. I had money from payday to payday. I never had that before. And I thought to myself, how is it possible I've got this money? I didn't get a raise. The only thing that's happened between my last paycheck and this paycheck is that I got saved. Oh, wait a minute. I stopped spending all my money on sinful stuff. I spent all my money. I, I might as well walked out the door after payday and having my check cashed. I might as well just walked out and threw it out in the world. It had been better off. Because that's what I was doing. I went to the world and the world took all my money. It took all my money. I couldn't believe how much money I had after I got saved because I didn't spend it on all that gobbledygook stuff that, that just burns it all up and you have nothing to show for it. Hangovers and, and bad relationships and yada yada. That was amazing to me. That was amazing to me. I'm a guy that likes to hold on to your money. I couldn't believe I was just doing that. In my right mind, I would have never done that. But I didn't have a right mind. I had a worldly mind. Now, maybe you never had that problem. I'm just telling you my story. I mean, I can't talk about yours. I don't know it. But I can tell you this. The real warfare, the real warfare in your life is to learn how to destroy speculations and every lofty thing raised up. Watch this now against the knowledge of God. Do you know what you're doing is sinful? Yes, then stop doing it. <laughs> is that, I mean, now would it make you feel better if I came and counseled you and you gave me $100? Would that make you feel better about your choices? Listen, it's, listen, you don't, what does the Bible say? Listen, just, just track your money if for no other reason. I mean, I, I just couldn't believe it. I, pfft, listen to that. So here's your responsibility. My responsibility is to destroy speculations and every lofty thing raised up against what? The knowledge of what the Bible says. And we are taking, what's the second step? And then we are to take every thought captive. You know what captive, captive, you know what ca captain, captive means. Write this down now. Write down 2 Timothy 2.26, because here's what it means to be captive. Taking every thought captive. <laughs> God wants you to take every thought captive to his will. That's what God wants. God wants take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. See, it's not one. It's not enough to take it captive, right? That's your first step. You got to take it captive. Take every thought captive, right, to the obedience of Christ. That's the second step. You know, we used to sing this song, trust and obey, for there's no other way. Trust and obey. This is really important. This is how you win in your life. This is how you win in your marriage. This is how you win in your business. This is how you win. In 2 Timothy 2.26, I ask you to write down in your paper, it says that the, de the devil is out to bring you captive to do his will. Use the same word, captive. 
His MOS is to bring you captive to be obedient to His will. God's desire is for you to bring the will of God to obedience in your life. And that's your warfare. And listen, now I'm not asking for a show of hands or anything. Are you winning? Are you winning? If you say to me, Pastor, I'm not sure if I am or not, ask your wife, ask your husband, ask your children, ask people in the family that really know you. You know, the kind of people you could answer the door in your underwear? Those kind of people. You know, those kind of people you could talk to. Put it on the line. I should not have to keep teaching you this over and over and over again. This should be a lesson you should be able to get and obey. Now, I'm going to keep teaching it over and over again, because you don't. And at some point, you're either going to leave me, or you're going to do it. You will be smart to stay with me. Tough it out. You'll be smart to tough it out with me. I don't have to tell you. Just track your money. Track your time. And see where it's taking you in the kingdom, in the joy of the journey. And I shouldn't have to tell you what you need to do. God has already told you. I must destroy speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And I need to take every thought that's engaged in that process, captive. You know what captive is? Not my will, but thy will be done. Not my will, but thy will be done to the obedience of Christ. In last week's lesson, I closed by not being able to get to a story. I ran out of time. Ananias and Sapphira. I put it on your paper and I asked you to study it before you got back. Not knowing if you would or not, I went ahead and added it to my second point today. This is found in Acts, the fifth chapter, 1 through 11. It's divided in two parts of a story. First the husband and then the wife. First the husband and then the wife. Ananias, the husband, is covered in verses 1 through 6, and Sapphira, the wife, is covered in verses 7 through 11. What is interesting about this story, write this down. It goes back to the fourth chapter. This story actually begins in the fourth chapter around verse 31 and goes into the fifth chapter. Something that was going on in the church that this couple were a part of that church along with a man called Barnabas that you're familiar with in the scriptures. There came a moment when Peter had to address the husband in what I call the first part of the story with a question. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? And then he goes on to explain it. That was his problem. All right? Now you have to read the whole story to get it. I want to focus on what he asked him. And the reason he poised it this way is Ananias knew better. Just like Adam knew better. Just like Eve knew better. They knew better because they had the wisdom or knowledge of God. And so he asked him a question that he should be able to answer straight up and straight out and not try to smoke Peter. You know, cover up this stuff. Peter asked him, 
Why has Satan filled your heart to lie? See, he's a liar. Now he's got lying working in, in Ananias' heart. This is a believer. And then he asked him again, verse, why? Why is it that you have conce conceived it, this deed in your heart? And again he says, you have not lied to men, the church, you've lied to God. See, it was all about a plot a scheme and a strategy. And they thought, Ananias thought, that he could do it in privacy and it never be known. You understand that? Ananias knew better than that. For a lot of reasons, but listen, right, right, I may have written this down, so if not, Psalms 44, 16. Did I write it? Listen to what it says. Listen to what it says. The Lord knows the secrets of men's hearts. So where are you going to hide? Where are you going to hide? <laughs> well, I, did, I do it in privacy. There's no such thing. Dear heart, and that's a good thing because not, God will never leave you nor forsake you, and that's a good thing. And let me tell you, you can't hide from him either. You can't hide from him. He's omnipresent. Can't hide from him. Not only that, guess who lives inside you? The Holy Spirit of God. Third member of the Godhead lives inside your body, right? Now, when everything's going good, you love that idea. And when everything's going bad, you hate that idea. Now notice, Peter talks to the wife. Verses 7 through 11. He asks, Why is it that you have agreed together? This word in the Greek language is where you get symphony. A symphony is a group of people that are on the same page of music. You know what I mean? Different instruments, but on the same page of music. That's harmony. Symphony. How is it that you two have come to an agreement together against the will of God. Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied. Uh, he says, why is it that you have agreed together to put the Holy Spirit of the Lord to the test and have kept back some of the price for himself with his, and this is in, in, in Ananias' part, with his wife, listen, when he did it, with his wife's full knowledge and consent. See, they had come into a secret agreement against God. Well, listen, he told them, listen, listen, your money's your money. The Lord didn't ask anything about it. But you conspired against him over, over money. You conspired against God over money. You should read the rest of that. It happened to the early church, and it was an awakening. Two funerals in the same day was an awakening. Here's the third point. Satan's strategy is to get believers to become distracted. Watch this word distracted now. From the importance of the directive will of God over their life. Listen. Listen. What he has to do is get you distracted. Then he goes in for the kill. You become distracted and then he convinces them that their life would be better off 
if they went against the revealed will of God. Your life would be so much better off if you stopped studying the Bible. You would be so much better off if you didn't go to that church anymore. You would be so better off if you just put that Bible down and forget it. He's got the fish hook in you. Of James 1, 14 and 15. You should read that now. James 1, 14 and 15. It is at this time when there is this awakening in you that the believer must draw the line. Because let me tell you what's that threat. Now, this is not on your paper, so write this down. Galatians 2.20 and Philippians 1.21. This is what's at risk. This is what you're risking, dear heart. Oh, you're going to lose a lot of stuff. But the most valued treasure in your life, you're going to lose. Listen to what Paul says. Philippians 1.21. This is how serious this is. Watch this. For me to live is, is what? Is that your life? For me to live. It didn't say where or what. For me to live. To, for me to be alive. For me to live is all about Christ. And to die is all gain, not loss. In, Gal in Galatians 2.20. Watch this. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it is not I who live, but he who lives in me. And the faith that I now live in me is where my victory is. See, when I got saved, I knew how weak I was. I knew it because all of what I had been spending my money on. <laughs> and I knew I, I could not vary from my course in my walk with Christ. I knew it. It was just common sense to me. You can't go back and play with that world, not one day, not one hour, not one moment, Ron Adema, or you'll be a dead duck. Because I was an all-in guy. When I ran with the devil, I was all in, and when I stopped running with him, I was all out. I was now in Christ and running hard with him, and I knew I had to stay in that lane. I couldn't run all over the court place I wanted and have any victory in my life. You need to know. You need to get back in your lane. You need to start living for Christ instead of all this other foolishness. You don't live your life for your wife. You don't live it for your children. You don't live it for your job. You live it for what? Christ, and he'll bring all this other stuff together in your life. He'll bring all this other stuff in your life in a proper order. you got to get the proper order. It's Christ. Christ. Husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church. Wives, love your husband. Like, be respectful and like Christ. And that's how it, it all starts there. You can't give up on that and think that somehow this is going to change. It's not. It's going to go into the toilet. I don't know. That may not be a good illustration, but... This is when the believer must draw a line in his life right now. Well, I'll do it tomorrow. My mother just bought a whole carton of cigarettes when she decided that she ought to quit smoking. She had just gotten recently saved. She said to me, how am I going to do that? I, 
I quit so many times, Ron. But I, I need to quit. Why? Well, she told me. I said, by what power can you do it? I don't know. I know it can't be by willpower. I said, well, this is your lucky day, Ma. It can be by Jesus' power. It can be by the Holy Spirit's power. I promise you that. This is an absolute truth, Mom. So I bought the carton of cigarettes for my mother. She was old school, boy. She was not going to. You want to. What am I going to do with the cigarettes? I said, well, throw them in the trash. No, that caused me. Eh, eh. All right, I'll buy them. Give them to me. What are you going to do with them? Hey, I bought them. They're mine. She understood that kind of talk. And I gave Galatians 5, 16, 17 to my mother as the first scripture. I said, when you get that craving tonight for a cigarette, you read that verse and you say, I need, I have tried to quit so many times. I know I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me and I know the Holy Spirit has power over the flesh and I know smoking is a flesh desire I want to get rid of. So when you read that, Mother, that's what all that means to you. And you pray that prayer. You pray, God, I am weak. I know I can't do this apart from your power. My mother put those cigarettes down and never picked them back up. She smoked three packs a day and had been since the age of 12. You know what that is? That's the power of God working that person's life. God wants to do that in your life. He wants to show you. God wants to show up and show out. He wants to do this in your life, people. He wants to do it in your marriage, in your children, in your business, and everything in your life. But you've got to buy into this program. You got to draw a line in the sand and say, "I'm through with that." Then my mother said to me one day, she said, "You know, I'm, I, I, I haven't been tempted to go back, but I'm afraid." I saw, she said the other night, "I prayed, Lord, don't." But she said, "I was afraid I'd get around people who smoked, and then I'd want to smoke again." That's, that was always her waterloo to get her back. And she said, I'm afraid that might happen. So I prayed the other night, Ron, what do you think? I prayed the other night and said, God, don't let me do that. I said, honey, I don't know. Maybe that'd be okay. We went to eat every Thursday. And we did, I did laundry, spiritual laundry for her on Thursdays. She said to me, I was with a group the other day that smoked. And do you know what happened, Ron? With my mother, I didn't know. I, uh, I, sometimes I was even afraid to say, tell me. She said, I got sick. The smell of the smoke made me sick. I mean, I had to get up. I was, I was nauseated. And I said, well, isn't that interesting? I wonder how that happened. And she said, do you suppose it could be that that's the answer to the prayer I prayed? I, I, I can't, don't think I can do that. I've never been strong enough to do that. Do you suppose that's what he did? And I went like, sounds good to me. I mean, what do I know? But sounds good to me, doesn't it? Sure fixed that in her life. It sure fixed that in her life. Listen, what am I trying to tell you? I, listen, that's a childlike faith. My mother had a childlike faith. She was 78 or something like that. Mother died at 80. She died at 80. It was before she died. She became a warrior. <laughs> Nobody better say to my mother, you can't quit smoking. I mean, she was a warrior about it. Listen, I don't care what your problem is in life. God, God, God has got it. He, he, he's got supernatural power in you to work through you. You've got to believe that, people. That's absolute truth. I'm talking absolute truth here today. I'm not guessing this stuff out. What's the Bible say? Then become united with him in doing it. Do it. Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 8, chapter, a really wonderful read sometime. John 8. Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 8, 1, 
uh, it, it, that started in 8.1, and he makes a statement in 43 of John 8. Why do, why do you not understand what I'm saying? It wasn't that they weren't smart enough. And it wasn't that they didn't have a Bible, and it wasn't that they weren't religious. That's the way a lot of you people are. Of course, not you who come and sit in the pew, but those who are watching by the Internet. What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? Why do you not understand what I'm saying? He gave an answer. <laughs> Listen, he gave an answer. He didn't leave it up for them to answer. Before they could even come up with the answer, it's because you cannot hear my words. Listen to me. If this is not on your paper, you ought to write it. You got to learn. Did I write this on your paper? You got to listen to learn to live the Word of God. You've got to listen. Hearing's not enough. You got to listen to understand how was this applying to my life? How was how do I bring this to my life? You've got to listen to understand how does this apply to my life today as I sit here. You got to listen with an ear to understand how to overcome, to be an overcomer, not to be run over, but to be an overcomer. So you got to listen, and you got to listen to learn. And you listen to learn so that you can live it out in your life. And that's just how simple this is. This is not complicated. Listen, the faith cycle begins with faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And then the next thing it says in, in, uh, in uh, Hebrews 4.2 is that you have to bring that to an understanding of faith. The word they heard did not profit them, Hebrews 4.2, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. You listen to learn to live. That's the system. And that's how the faith cycle works. That's the way the faith cycle works. In the parable of the sower, on the roadside, Matthew 13, 18, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one, Satan, comes and snatches it away, what's been sown in their heart. He snatches it away from them. You know why? Because they never took it to a place of faith. They never took it to a place of faith. Not faith in the word of God. The heart is the place of faith, but faith in what? Faith in what is what you ask? What's the Bible say? Let me, let me get out of this today. Four. Satan's strategy is to blind the minds. Blind your mind. In order to disrupt the faith cycle being revealed, the faith cycle that's been revealed, the directive will of God, to life experiences. If you go to church and hear the Word of God and don't put it into a life so that it's exercised, Satan's happy with you. If you begin to put it in that exercise, then you become a threat to his kingdom. See, they have the two kingdoms at odds with each other. He controls the kingdoms of the world, and Jesus is the kingdom of God. Not complicated stuff. You just make it complicated by not listening. Next chapter, verse 6, we're told to do the will of God from the heart. In Psalms 119.11, the psalmist wrote, Your word have I hid in my heart that I what? You know the rest of that? That I might not sin against God. Draws the line. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not send against God. This is for me, Ron Adama. That's that Psalms on your paper. That's that Psalms. When, 
in 1 Samuel 16, 7, we're told again in a human life experience that the Lord looks at the heart of men. That's a wonderful passage. So we need to understand that in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, his job is to blind the minds of those that are unbelieving. Jesus said to the Jewish religious leaders in that John 8 passage, why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you have not heard my word. He says it in verse 43, 45, 46, 47, until they got tired of hearing it. Watch how Satan lied about Adam and Eve's eyes being opened. You know, he told them that, didn't he? Your eyes will be open. And did it happen? Yeah. But listen, what he didn't tell you, that God tells you, is what they saw. <laughs> what they had, their eyes were opened from human experience. Well, what they saw was totally different than what they imagined they would see when they sinned. And when you read the rest of the story, which we will do next week, when we read more on into Genesis 3, you will see that they had a concept of being naked and ashamed. And they went out and they sowed fig leaves as a covering for their head, right? A covering for their head? What do you think they sowed a, 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 a poison ivy? No. That had been me. I went out to get fig leaves. It would have been poison ivy. Do you know what they, you know what they, and what they, what they were now ashamed of? Their marriage. Well, you need to know what they went out and sowed to cover. And then you ought to read how important that idea is in Genesis 2, 25. Yeah, their eyes got opened all right. I've been snookered. I have been had. And so it is. Well, there's more to read, and we'll come back to this next week, this idea of their nakedness and their shame and all of that. Don't go there. Please don't go there. And if you do, there's a way home. Don't go there. Our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our life, cause us to have ears to hear, that we might listen to learn to live for God. to live the Christ-like life. It's where the joy is. That's where the victory is. Take this offering we're about to take, Father. May we be good stewards of it. May we reach to the ends of Moody.